Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. Good to see everybody here. Thanks for everybody that's online. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, let's say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight and for this time to be able to study your word. Uh, we pray that you would uh, open our minds and help us learn what you would have us to learn and uh, see the truths you would have for us. In your name, amen. Okay, tonight we're going to be looking at dolmens in the valley. Did I just, okay. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to go straight through this. I've got a lot of slides. This is being, uh, am I cutting out? No? So this is being recorded on YouTube. And uh, I'm going to go through some slides very fast. And it, later you can go back to YouTube and re-watch the video if you want to spend time looking at any particular other slides. I'm going to be uh, just five points, and you can look at them. Out? I, it sounds like I'm cutting out. What? Okay. Um, so I'm going to put out a couple threads, and then they might hang out there for a minute as I go through and uh, tie them together. Okay. Yeah, I'll switch to the other mic if it keeps cutting out. Let, just let me know. So first I want to talk about a blog that I ran across as I was studying all this. And I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, in this blog, he, they were, he was saying, understanding how the pagan gods of the ancient world have successfully rebranded themselves as action heroes for major motion pictures might be useful for reaching the lost. As Balderia wrote, and that was a French poet from the mid-1800s, the finest trick of the devil is to persuade you that he does not exist. Recent research shows that nearly 60% of American Christians have fallen for that lie, and that recent is 2009 from Barna Group, and the title of their study was Most American Christians Do Not Believe That Satan or the Holy Spirit Exist. So, God's statement is as true today as it was 2,700 years ago. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How do you resist an enemy you think is make-believe? Zeus, Hercules, the Olympians, and the Titans are real. They hate us, they want to kill us, and they are coming back. And again, that was the Barnard Group, 2009. There's a link there. And the other part was a reference to Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of God, I will also ignore your children. And there's a couple, there's many, many threads that go into this situation. And I think since 2009, it's actually become far, far worse. So let's look real quick at a couple threads, or a couple things that go into this. One is something that's been in, can become endemic in everything throughout the world. That's the marxist leninist atheism. So it's based upon a dialectical materialist understanding of humanity's place in nature. marxist leninist atheism proposes that religion is the opium of the people. Thus, Soviet Marxism-Leninism advocates scientific atheism rather than religious belief. And this is tied in with what's called dialectical materialism. It's a philosophical approach to reality derived from the writings of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. For Marx and Engels, materialism meant that the material world, perceptible to the senses, has objective reality independent of mind or spirit. They adopted a thoroughgoing materialist approach. So there was, <clears throat> this is the, and so that became the philosophy of materialism. So what is the idea of this? Materialism is the idea that everything is either made of only matter or is ultimately dependent upon matter for its existence and nature. Most forms of materialism tend to reject the existence of spirit or anything non-physical. Materialism is closely associated and aligned with the natural sciences. And atheists are usually materialists. Okay, so let's, now going back to uh, dolmens, let's talk about the Jordan Rift Valley. The Jordan Rift Valley is a geographic region that includes the entire length of the Jordan River from its sources through the Hula Valley. And the sources are 
of the uh, Jordan River is, is Mount Hermon, where the melting snow and the rainfall has tributaries that flow down and form the Jordan River. So it goes, uh, this goes down to the Dead Sea, the lowest land elevation on Earth, and then it continues through the Arabah Depression. It goes to the D Gulf of Aqaba, mm -hmm. whose shorelines it incorporates, until it finally reaches the Red Sea. <coughs> The plate boundary, which extends through the valley, is various called the Dead Sea Transform or the Dead Sea Rift. The boundary separates the Arabian plate from the African plate, connecting the divergent plate boundary in the Red Sea, which is called the Red Sea Rift, to the East Anatolian Fault in Turkey. So this fault goes all the way from Turkey down through Israel all the way down to the Red Sea. So it's a very large fault, and this fault forms this valley that is what the Jordan River and all the, the Gal Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are in. Okay, so this Hula Valley that it mentioned is an agriculture region in northern Israel with abundant fresh water, <coughs> which used to be Lake Hula prior to its draining. Lake Hula and the marshlands surrounding it were a breeding ground for mosquitoes carrying malaria and so were drained in the 1950s. An estimated 500 million migrating birds now pass through the Holy Hula Valley every year. So more than 60 inches of precipitation falls on the Hermon mountain range, only a few kilometers north of the valley, most of, mostly in the form of snow, feeding underground springs, including the source of the Jordan River, and creating these tributaries, and all eventually flowing through the valley before its drainage it could not easily be distinguished because of the marsh. So here's some maps, and we see here, here's the uh, Sea of Galilee. Up here is Mount Hermon. And the, flow, the Jordan River kind of flows down through here. And you can see this Golan Heights area is a very large area that, that extends through this whole region. And we'll look at this again, but Mount Hermon's over here. The Golan Heights area is all through here. Down here is the, red, is the uh, Sea of Galilee. So the, here's some current pictures, a relatively recent picture of the Hula Valley. So it's, a, it's become a large farming area. So I'm just going to flip through these real quick, in different pictures of the Hula Valley. Uh, that mountain in the background there is uh, Mount Hermon. And there's another one of Mount Hermon across the, across the valley. Uh, so again, this is Mount Hermon up here. The Hula Valley is actually way down here. It's, it's way down in this reason, region, just north of the Sea of Galilee. It's in this area up in here. So what is a dolmen? Dolmens are generally dated to the third millennium. On the Golan Heights, they are nar more narrowly defined to be between 2250 BC and about 1800 BC. Based on pottery shards, shards found near some of the dolmens in Jordan, the megaliths closer to the Dead Sea may also be as old as the beginning of the early Bronze Age, about 3300 BC. If the Bible is accurate, and we believe it is, then the time and location suggest that the builders of the dolmens were the Rephaim tribes who constructed them in the centuries before Abraham's arrival in the area. By the time the Israelites returned from Egypt around 1406 BC, only Og's small kingdom remained of the Rephaim, possibly the last of the dolmen builders in the Levant. So the Jordan River, which is what flows down from the Mount Hermon range to the Hula Valley to the Sea of Galilee, there are many dolmens in this valley. The root word for dolmen means table. While dolmens are found all over the world, there are more than of these structures in, in Jordan and the Golan Heights than anywhere else. They are large megalithic structures made of two standing stones and a capstone. <clears throat> like a table across the top, with no cement holding the slabs together. The highest concentration of dolmens in the region is on and around the Golan Heights, where the Rafa King Og once ruled. A recent survey of the Golan found more than 5,000 dolmens. In Jordan, another 20,000 dolmens have been found. In 2012, archaeologists examined a massive multi-chambered dolmen on the Shamir Dolmen Field on the western foothills of the Golan Heights, a site with over 400 dolmens. What was truly remarkable about this particular dolmen was the discovery of rock art on the other underside of the capstone, a basalt slab weighing about 50 tons. That's the first time art has been found inside any of the thousands of dolmens in the region, possibly the first written or artistic record that might be connected directly to the biblical Rephaim. 
Dolmens once connected and may still connect our material realm to the spiritual plane. Just as threshing floors link heaven and earth, Rephaim and Canaanite tribes saw these as sacred places to speak to the dead. Dolmens are sometimes grouped into expansive necropolises, or cities of the dead. Scholars use the term necropolis despite the lack of burial evidence in most of the dolmens because the dolmens were constructed within vast graveyards. The standing stones, the table legs, were associated with stone doorways or portals. And here's an example, this is from uh, Bible Places, of, uh, of a uh, dolmen, couple of dolmens in the Golan Heights area. Uh, this map shows, for instance here, this, this here shows that if this uh, symbol says there's 500 plus right in this area, so Chorazim right in here, there's 400 plus dolmens. Up here, Shamir. 400 plus dolmens. And then the smaller, next smaller one is 50 plus, next smaller one is 10 to 50, and the smallest one is 1 to 10. And they're just all over this. The, when they drained the swamp and, and it, the water came back, they found this whole area here was ringed with just a continuous, continuous fields of dolmens all in this area. So a paper was published, <coughs> and these were by uh, people from, you know, they're, they're this Gon and Sharon, Aunt Alan Barash. If you look at their thing, they're from all from high-end universities and government agencies in Israel. Monumental megalithic burial and rock art tell a new story about the Levant Intermediate Dark Bronze Age. So we're going to look at some of the things that were written in this paper. And this paper is available for download, so there's a link, there'll be a link for that. And if you want to get this paper and look through it, you can. It's, it's, uh, you can get it for no charge. Um, <coughs> this is from the paper. Um, they're showing this picture, and this is, in the sh this is at Shamir. And uh, so this is the village right here of uh, Kibbutz Shamir. And, oh yeah, okay, yeah. This, is, uh, this area here is Kibbutz Shamir. And then this is the area they were studying. And there's a bunch of dolmens in here. So if you look... Where is, where is uh, Kibbutz Shamir? So if we go here, it's, again, here's the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon, and right here, this Kibbutz Shamir is, is right in here. So there's Caesarea Philippi. So it gives you an idea where it's at, right in here. So, and then back in the background here, this area here, this is Mount Hermon, Golden Heights. And this is the close-up of what they were studying. And uh, this uh, number three, dolmen number three, was, the, was the big, this big fit one with the 50-ton top. And what they did was they highlighted it. So here, this is, this is the, this 50-ton top that they highlighted right here. And it's associated with these two smaller uh, sub parts of this whole thing. So this is all kind of one construction. So here's a picture of a No, is it okay? Okay now. Okay. So here's a picture of a researcher under this 50-ton tabletop studying this uh, this dome. And uh, here's underneath it and here's this rock art, rock art panel. And so we're going to do a compare and contrast. So a lot of people, I've been listening to a lot of people on various discussion groups on uh, podcasts and on videos, talking about these things, going back to the first thing I showed you about how many people believe this stuff's all imaginary. So when they think about, they, when they talk about these people back in the old times doing this stuff, they basically think there's something wrong with these people. I mean, they're either nuts or they're on drugs or they're whacked out or what is their problem? You know, or they're just, their imaginations have gone wild. So when they hear about this kind of rock art, what is it that they're picturing? How are they thinking about this? So I made, I made a, my theoretical idea of how they're picturing it. This rock art panel, they might picture it like that. I mean, that's kind of a fantasy, uh, they're kind of fantasy world imaginings of, of a, it's like Dungeons and Dragons or fi, sci, fantasy sci-fi. I mean, that's, you know, is that, and, and the question is, is that really what it is? is? I mean, that's what they apparently think it is. 
But here's some, what they actually found. Here's some pictures of what they found of this rock area. And they used a laser scanner, and they got these images off of, the, off of that ceiling. And it had all kinds of interesting markings on it. And here's, here's some more markings that they found. And that almost looks like maybe a trident. I don't know, but they have not... See these, how these are shaped like that? Uh, there's another one. I mean, it's got kind of a trident look to, to it, but I don't know. They, they, have not, they have not deciphered this yet. They don't know what, these, what this artwork means. So they're still trying to figure that out. There's a lot of things about dolmens they're still trying to figure out that they just don't, they're not sure of. Especially the burials. They're not, they're not sure about that. Uh, here's what they found uh, on the ground that was below the ceiling. Okay, and they kind of gone down into the ground and searched through it, and they found this archaeological layer, and they found that they were putting stashes of stuff into the inside of the dolmen. So they were performing some kind of rituals, and they were stashing stuff in the dolmens. And again, let's think about, from the, from the point of view of the people in this poll, or that were studied, that had this idea, what, how are they thinking about, what did they think they were putting in there, or how are they, or why, you know, what, just in general, what were they thinking? So I was thinking, okay. If I was them, I would think, well, maybe they were putting dolmen trading cards in there. You know, they might have had all kinds of dolmen trading cards, and they're putting them under there because, hey, you know, these are valuable. Or maybe they were putting dioramas and game boards. These are their, their uh, D&D fantasy game boards of their gods and their history and all the stuff they're imagining there. They got all these different game boards and game pieces, right? Because it's all imaginary, so they're, they're playing it out. And then, of course, they would go and have tournaments in, these, you know, in the dolmen fields because, of, hey, it's a great Disney-like stage. It's a great setting. And so they would go play their uh, D&D games, right? I mean, this is apparently what people are thinking. And maybe, maybe individually, before they go to the tournaments, they're playing off, you know, to see who can go to the tournament with their, you know, in front of the dolmens. But here's what they actually found. They found a lot of uh, kind of cool-looking ceramic beads and other ceramic things in the ground. And apparently the ancient looked at these beads as connecting their, something they wore. It's like an amulet. Um, putting their life force into the dolmen, and then it was being transmitted to these ancestors that they were worshiping. And it was like it made, they, they seemed to be thinking that it was like it was making a two-way hedge of protection. So on the one hand, it was making a hedge around their ancestors to protect them, but it was also like a wall to protect them from their ancestors. In other words, they... They were doing these rituals because they were afraid if they didn't do it, they would get attacked. They would be harassed and attacked and hot and made sick and all kinds of things. They, you know. So this is another picture. Uh, I was not able to find, the only thing I'd find on this paper so far, I, I think I can find it, but I haven't been able to get the actual full copy, was this uh, Dolmens and Levant. But this is the cover page, which has a cool picture of this, uh, this uh, dolmen. But this guy here, this, uh, this, uh, this gentleman over here, reminds me of a guy out of the first Star Wars movie. <laughs> he could, you know, he's a kind of interesting looking outfit that he's got on there. So here's a, just a couple other pictures uh, in northern Jordan of a dolmen. This is actually, Mark found this, this video that was recently posted by a guy that found an interesting looking thing on Google Earth. And it's somewhere in the desert southwest. He didn't want to say where it was, right? He didn't want to say, tell people where it was, but it's somewhere in the desert southwest of this country. And he went and found it, and he found some dolmens, but he didn't, which he didn't know. Nowhere, he, in the video, if you go watch his video that he posted, he has no idea what he's looking at. <laughs> you think it's really cool. He has no idea what it is. So then he put up a drone, and there's three of them. There's one here, and there's one here. And these things are huge. And then there's a smaller one, right? Uh, okay, so there's one here. And there's one here, and there's a smaller one here. So, you know, that was very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, either Arizona or New Mexico. So, and there's, there's, I could just spend the whole evening showing pictures for, of dolmens. There's a really big, tall one in Montana. And, <clears throat> but this is interesting, this rock wall, which Mark thinks he might have been at. Yeah, Mark was over one, one of these walls. It might have been this wall. So the post says that um, this is one of the nearly unknown megalithic sites of Israel, Kerbet Beteha. It's essentially a small version of Gilgal Rephaim. The site is about a mile north of the Sea of the Sea of Galilee. The hills in the background are on the far side of the Jordan River. That's cutting out. We visit one, two, three. Uh, why don't you give me a handheld? Because this is the thing's not working. So this site is about a mile north of the Sea of Galilee. The hills in the background are on the far side of the Jordan River. We visited this site yesterday, thank, and, and this is Derek Gilbert, who's no relation, uh, was in Israel. And so he visited the site. He was taken there by an archaeologist that had found it or that was aware of it. Um, so he said, we visited this site yesterday, and this was posted on March 17, 2023. We visited the site yesterday thanks to Aaron Lipkin's willingness to go well off the beaten path. That was their guide. Because we think this is the area called Bethany across the Jordan in John 1.28. Greek Bethania is a transliteration of Batania, the Greek form of Bashan. Hence, John was baptizing in Bashan across the Jordan, north of the Sea of Galilee right where we find Bethsaida and Capernaum, Jesus' base of operations after the arrest of John. Bethsaida, home to four of the first apostles, Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel, is only half a mile from here. And this archaeologist showed him a rock that was right there that had inscriptions. It's a little bit difficult to see in this photo, but he thinks l later traveling uh, tribes inscribed on this rock for, a purpose of, for two purposes. One, to show that this is an area they went through, but to show that they knew that this is where uh, the calming of the sea happened and the feeding of the 5,000 happened. That's what he thinks the symbols that are carved there represent. And there's uh, basically there's a serpent on there, and there's a fish. So there's also a book that's come out recently, Discovering the City of Sodom, by Dr. Stephen Collins, who's the head of the archaeological team that's currently excavating uh, Sodom. And uh, it's <clears throat> there's a map here, this map showing where, where Sodom is in relation to the Dead Sea. So here's the Dead Sea, here's the Sea of Galilee. So it's right, right in this area where they're excavating uh, Sodom. Here's a couple things they found at Sodom. So Sodom is a huge, huge city compared to other, like, Jeru I mean, Jerusalem's tiny. At the time, was tiny compared to Sodom, as many of the other cities were, so uh, or, you know, compared to Sodom. They were all pretty small. This was a huge... Uh, area and they they've been doing a lot of work on this and this is probably one of the biggest archaeological digs in archaeological history and still they're basically scratching the surface it's so huge but so far uh, they're saying that uh, this tall El Haman is the site of biblical Sodom it's the largest sacred landscape in the region that's on the eastern side of the site so there's this terrace on the eastern side of the site and they find all these dolmens it, this area is larger than Stonehenge over 500 bench-like stone dolmens are still intact. Originally, they know there was 1,500 dolmens right there. 
The domains they found to have precise astronomical alignments, and they were aligned to the equinoxes and the solstices. And they know from what they found so far that the dolmens are used for seasonal ceremonies. But here's the interesting thing. The center of the city has not been disturbed. Nobody has gone in. There's no tunnels. There's no diggings. Nobody has gone in and robbed anything. It hasn't even been accessed. They're still up above it as they're moving through the layers, digging, you know, going through the layers. But I watched an interview with this head of the project that just came up a couple weeks, this just was posted a couple weeks ago, and he said they're pretty sure because Sodom was continuously inhabited for thousands of years, they, and he believes in the city center there was a city archive. And he said this will be the first city archive ever discovered intact. And he, that's going to be a big deal. That's going to be, I mean, a, a really, really big deal if they find that city archive. And he's pretty excited about it. Okay. So they also found that they know that they were doing rituals with bones, torches, olive oil, and grain. And this is interesting. This, this Hammond megalithic field that we're talking about includes not only dolmens, but also menhirs, which are standing stones, stone alignments, hinges, stone circles, all signaling the cultic sacredness of the area. It's the largest such assemblage of megalithic structures in Levant. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing. So around 1200 BC, just before its destruction by the so-called Sea Peoples, Ugarit crowned its last king. A ritual text designated KTU 1.161 by scholars suggests that the ill-fated Emerupai III who was probably killed when a city was overrun, was crowned with a necromancy rite that summoned the spirits of his royal ancestors, the Rephraim. So this comes out of this, this uh, Ugaritic text. You are summoned, O Rephraim of the earth. You are invoked, O council of Dedanu. And it goes on. But the point I'm making in this ritual is they are calling up these spirits as Rephaim. So it says, there is no question that these Rephaim are the same group called by that name in the Bible. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you, all who are leaders of the earth. It raises their thrones, all who's, who are kings of the nations, Isaiah 14.9. The interesting thing about that is this translation of this word into the word shades is actually the word Rephaim, okay? And it's in the Eastern, Easton's, Bible Diction, Easton's Bible Dictionary. Uh, you can see right here, Rephaim, a race of giants who lived on the East Jordan from whom Og was descended. They were probably the original inhabitants of the land before migration of the Canaanites. They were conquered by Shelaram, and their territories were promised as a possession to Abraham, okay? Now, the Septuagint, also directly translated that as Rephaim. The book of Enoch. In chapter 15, it says, But you from the beginning were made spiritual, possessing a life which is eternal. So he's talking to, to, to these, these spiritual angels in heaven, or that were in heaven, these spiritual beings, and not subject to death forever. You're not subject to death. Therefore, I made you not wives for you because being spiritual, your dwelling is in heaven and you're never going to die, so you don't need a replacement. Now, the giants who have been born of spirit and of flesh shall be called upon earth evil spirits, and on earth shall be their habitation. Evil spirits shall proceed from their flesh because they were created from above, from the holy watchers, was their beginning and primary foundation. Evil spirits shall they be upon the earth, and the spirits of the wicked shall they be called. The habitation of the spirits of heaven shall be in heaven, but upon earth shall be the habitation of terrestrial spirits who are born on earth. The spirits of the giants shall be like clouds, which shall oppress, oppress, corrupt, fall, contend, and bruise upon earth. They shall cause lamentation. No food shall they eat, and they shall be thirsty. This is telling you that the habitation for the souls of the Rephaim when they die is on the earth because no place was, a place was made for them. And so they're on the earth. As opposed to humans that, you know, we'll see, they don't 
we don't stick around when we die. We're not staying here. So in Ezekiel 32, 27, Septuagint, and they are laid with they are laid with the giants that fell of old, who went down to Hades with their weapons of war, and they laid out their swords under their heads, but their iniquities were upon their bones, because they terrified all men during their life. And in the Dead Caesar's scrolls, there's multiple references to the spirits of the bastards. Now, bastard is a person of dubious status. Whether the term denotes an, the offspring of an unmarried woman or the offspring of mixed parentage, one Gentile parent is unclear. A bastard cannot enter into the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation of descendants. So we'll see why that's important here in a second. For thus they alert the watchers. This is in Reuben 567. For thus they alert the watchers who were before the flood. For as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them, and they conceived the act in their mind. For they changed themselves into the shape of men, and appeared to them when they were with their husbands. And the women lusting in their minds after their forms gave birth to giants, for the watchers appeared to them as reaching even unto heaven. So this thing about bastard spirits. Ezekiel 32 talks about the mighty chiefs, but in the Septuagint, they're referred to as the giants who are in the midst of Hades, the midst of Sheol. Verse 27 in Ezekiel 32, in the Septuagint, says, they slept with the giants who had fallen from eternity. So we've got the sense that the Jewish scholars who translated it from the Hebrew understood that it was the spirits of the giants who were in Sheol. There are five passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls where there's a phrase that's used of demons, spirits of the bastards that a bastard is someone that doesn't have a human father would be the logical understanding within this context. They're talking about the watchers and demons, and, they're call, and they call them spirits of the bastards. So the idea there is that they don't have a human father, and they have an, they, they have an angelic father. Uh, Beth Saida, which was, we, we looked at, heard about that earlier, up there north of the Sea of Galilee, the excavation site of El Tel is located in a public recreation area known as Jordan Park and is believed by archaeologists to be Bethsaida. Bethsaida is one of the most frequently mentioned towns in the New Testament. He gave sight to the blind man, and not far away, he taught and fed a crowd of 5,000. And from the Bethsaida shore, he was seen walking on the Sea of Galilee. Indeed, Bethsaida, Chorazan, and Tabga, with Capernaum as the basis midpoint, constituted the evangelical triangle on the northwestern end of the Sea of Galilee, within which approximately 80% of Jesus' public ministry was exercised, according to the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, writes biblical scholar Daniel Casey. The first century Roman writer Pliny the Elder called Bethsaida one of, the four, one of four lovely cities on the Sea of Galilee. Yet, like Capernaum and Chorazim, Bethsaida was abandoned and forgotten for many centuries. Why is, the, why is the Bethsaida site today a mile away from the shore of Galilee? An earthquake has lifted El Tel, and the Sea of Galilee has shrunk in size. In Christ's day, according to biblical archaeological Bargill Pixner, the Jordan River did not sweep in a large loop as it does today, but flowed straight into a shallow lagoon before reaching the lake. So a small part of Bethsaida lay on the west bank of the river. In 2019, archaeologists reported finding the remains of a large Byzantine-era church, which they believed to be the Church of the Apostles, built over the house of the Apostle Peter and Andrew. This church was described by a visiting bishop in 725. Three years later, the discovery of a mosaic inscribed with a petition to the head and leader of the heavenly apostles, assumed to be St. Peter, strengthened the claim that this site was Bethsaida. Is that, that Mark, that might be the church you went to? You went to that one too? Yeah. So Bethsaida, if we look here, where is Bethsaida? It's on this map. It's down here. Hold on. So tell Bethsaida is this marker right here, and there's the Sea of Galilee as it is today. So it's right here. So it gives you an idea where it is. So 
so you can you can look at this whole thing later. I just want to point out, uh, Michael Heiser posted uh, uh, just like a blog about discerning the dead. And what I, he in this blog he he makes the differentiation between human dead, which is one word, metim, and the rephaim, the dead that are rephaim. Okay, and goes through some confusing passages talking about the dead. Uh, so he says, that briefly, the Rephaim are mostly generally the dead kings or great warriors of antiquity. Sources within and outside the Bible confirm this identification. In the biblical cases, however, the Rephaim are related literally to the giant clans in the Old Testament. These clans are in turn identified as descendants of the Nephilim, who were offspring of human women and divine beings. And he, this one verse talks about uh, that the human dead have no knowledge. And that's often used to say that, well, if the human dead have no, have no nothing, don't know what's going on, that they're, they're, they're just not around at all. But what Michael Heiser is saying is <clears throat> the dead here, Matim, appear to be the, are the human dead, not human, non-human spirits in the underworld. The knowledge in context being referred to is the knowledge of the living life in the world of the living, the world of the readers. The dead, the human dead, don't know anything about that since they're dead and they're in the underworld. And at the time this was written, you know, before Yeshua led the captives out captive, led them out, they were in paradise where there's the gulf and then there's a place of torments, and he emptied out paradise, you know, when he, during, after the crucifixion. But he's saying that, the human dead aren't around here. They're not watching what's going on because they're, they're gone. They're in another place. So that's as opposed to the Rephaim dead. They are here. And back then and even up to today, there are people to try to contact them because they have knowledge of what's going on. Okay, so that's the differentiation. Uh, so Jubilees explains a little more of what happened with Noah. So the unclean demons after Noah, after, they land, after the ark landed and they started, you know, repopulating, <coughs> the unclean demons that all, you know, there was, was a lot of them because they all died from the flood. So all these, there was just a massive number of these spirits around. These unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to destroy them. And the sons of Noah, the sons of Noah came to Noah and said, hey, these demons, you know, they're causing all kinds of trouble, and they're blinding us, and they're killing us. So Noah went and prayed to God, and after he prayed to God about this problem, it says in uh, 7, 10, 7, and the Lord our God bade us to bind them all. So he gave them permission to get these guys all bound up and sent away. But then the chief of the spirits, Mestima, that is Satan, came and said, Lord Creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice, and do, not, and do all that I say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are, for these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment, for great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And so Yahweh said, okay, we'll let a tenth part of them remain. So 10% can stay and 90% go. So they locked up 90% of them, but 10% stayed. So that's why in the scriptures you see places where it says they're bound and locked up, and other places they're saying they're, they're, they're here. Well, they're in both places. 90% got locked up, 10% left out because Yahweh said, yeah, you know, Satan can have 10% of them to carry out his will because Satan's just a you know, finite being. He can't be running around everywhere all at the same time. So... What's not clear is the Rephaim, the Rephaim that died after this point, you know, what was the policy? Did some portion of them have to be locked up and some portion left out? Was there a percentage that had to be out that was enough as the human population increased? The Satan could have enough. Basically, they were his minions. You know, the, the movie Minions? That, his minions, okay, his, his foot soldiers. They were carrying out, doing his will. So anyway, there was some kind of a pattern set up there that there's going to be some number of them available to Satan to carry out his will on the earth. Okay. So, uh, now there's another thing we need to look at is this thing about uh, Adam needing an heir. 
So the Amorites set the religious and cultural tone for society from about the time of 2000 BC, which is roughly the time of Abraham, maybe a little before, down to the time of the Exodus. The Amorites did not see a separation between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. The dead ancestors were always with you. It's kind of an Eastern concept to us now. You get, an, you get Asian cultures, where this is also very true to this day, African culture, where this is still very true, but here in the West, we've lost that. But that was the worldview of the people who lived in and around the ancient Israelites. You had to appease the ancestors and provide for them to provide sustenance for them in the afterlife. The afterlife. Otherwise, they would fade away. They would cease to exist. That was their belief. This is why Abraham and Sarah were so concerned that they didn't have a living descendant, a son and heir. There is a scholar by the name of Dr. Nicholas Wyatt who points out when Abraham tells God, I will have to make Eliezer of Damascus my heir, that the phrase Damascus is actually a scribal correction done later because the scribe did not understand what Abraham was saying. Ben Mashiach means son of the cup. Ha Damashek means of Damascus. So Ben Mashiach, son of the cup, the one who pours out the, libra- the libation or the drink offering every month to sustain the dead in the afterlife. Abraham saying, look, I don't have an heir. I will have to name Eliza my servant as the son of the cup to keep me and Sarah. Abraham at that time didn't have the worldview that was revealed to the prophets later or to the disciples by Jesus' day. They didn't have the understanding of Sheol and Hades that developed through time. There was a real change in the way Jews saw the afterlife during the Second Temple period. So Abraham was still affected by the views that were there at the time of what, you know, because Yahweh didn't drop every, does, Yahweh doesn't act like the other side where they just go and drop all this information into people's heads. He doesn't do that. He, he lets people gradually assimilate and learn and grow over time. And if you do it with respect to human dignity and how humans are and how they learn, you can see just by looking at the scriptures that it takes a significant amount of time. Yahweh is very patient, and this whole thing developed. He didn't, he didn't force it into people's heads. This, he, this revelation occurred through time. And so this is why Abraham was thinking this way. He did, that information wasn't yet available to him. He was, he was thinking in the way that everybody was thinking at the time. So the idea is that this stuff was real, but they had twisted ideas about reality. They, they didn't have absolute, pure, total, 100% accurate knowledge. They had knowledge, and they were dealing with real things, but they didn't have deep, detailed, intricate knowledge of what was going on. They just kind of had a brush, brush strokes, you know, broad brush strokes of what was going on, and a lot of things they thought they were thinking about weren't quite right, partially because these spirit beings were misleading them. And you see this all through Scripture and the, the way this whole hierarchy of these beings, everything in the world system is run on disinformation and lies and propaganda, and everybody's being manipulated, both humans and the spirit world. Everybody in the spirit world all the way up to the top, everybody's being manipulated with lies and, and propaganda to be controlled. So anyway, that's kind of what was happening there. So the valley of the shadow of death... <coughs> In Matthew 4, 4, 12, upon hearing of John the Baptist's arrest, Jesus withdrew to Galilee and established residence in Capernaum, a town situated by the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is located along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and is approximately one mile away from Bethsaida. Capernaum is positioned within the territories of Zebulun and Naphtali. The east, that's east of the Jordan River, land of Bashan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The relocation of Capernaum is Capernaum is a fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. This prophecy refers to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea, which is the Roman road known as Via Maris, which traversed from Egypt to the Sea of Galilee, then along the Jordan Valley to Damascus. The Jordan River flows through a valley between Mount Hermon Dan, Chorizon, and the Hula Marsh area. 
The Hula Marsh was previously a lake when the marsh was drained in the 1950s. It was found to be surrounded by dolmens. The region near the marsh, particularly near Shamir Kibbutz, is considered a hub of dolmen culture. Dolmens are prevalent in the area and have been there for thousands of years. Scholars remain uncertain about the exact significance of dolmens despite extensive study over two centuries. So that gives us this, all this information we've been getting then gives us a little bit more information about the story about Legion. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And this is north of the Sea of Galilee. The tombs would have also been where the dolmens are. Okay? So that's where he was, he was inhabiting. Okay? And the dolmens and the tombs is where the spirits are, and the spirits were in this guy. Okay? That, it's all happening right there. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles to pieces. Now, no one had the strength of his doom. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying and cutting himself. And I'll skip down to, now there was a great herd of pigs feeding there on the hillside. Okay, that wasn't just a random chance that there was a herd of pigs there. The whole culture, there was a huge economy within the culture of all the peoples for having herds of pigs next to these sites of these graves and these dolmens for the rituals, there was only one purpose for the pigs to be there, is they were selling them to the people as they were going into the dolmens to perform the rituals, and they would get a pig to do a sacrifice. So that's what the pigs were there for. Okay, and this is a, this is a big part of their economy. There were, all, there were these herds of pigs near all these areas where people were going into these dolmen grave sites. Leviticus 20, verses 1 through 6, is a prohibition against sacrificing to Molech using mediums necromancers. It is not merely illegitimate cultic practice, but the practice of the cult of the dead. This realization makes sense also of the condemnation of the guilty party's entire clan. In verse 5, we saw in Mary and Ugarit, those were major city-states in the ancient Near East. The cult of the dead is a family affair to secure the blessings and avert the wrath of past family for the sake of family present. Psalm 106 references sacrificing children to demons. You go up to verse 28, and we find the reason God sent the plague to kill 24,000 Israelites on the plains of Moab before they crossed over and attacked Jericho was because they were eating sacrifices offered to the dead. That was part of the worship of the cult of all peor, and that, will, and that word peor in that context is based on a Hebrew word that means gap or cleft or opening. And in this context, the meaning is probably the entrance to the netherworld. So Baal Peor was the lord of the entrance to hell. And the Israelites had been drawn into that worship by eating sacrifices. Okay. This is all tied in. They, where they were performing these rituals was at the dolmens. That's the whole reason they were built. Okay, so offering to the dead is part and parcel of the practice of sacrificing children to Moloch. The reason that we don't see references specifically to dolmens in the Old Testament is because English language translators, oh, demons, I said, sorry, I said that wrong. The reason that we don't see reference specifically to demons in the Old Testament is because the English language translators looked at Rephaim, because that was the word they were looking at, and they didn't understand what the Rephaim were to the ancient Israelites and their neighbors. It's only, they've only figured this out recently, fairly recently. They didn't realize this was a special class of spirit in the afterlife that was believed to be the ancestral spirit, specifically the ancestors of the royal houses of the Amorites who had to be sacrificed to and appeased in order to secure their blessings. And then, of course, he had the household gods that were represented by the teraphim theme, which you know Jacob's wife stole from her father David's wife, and she had one of them in their bedroom, which is how David escaped the agents of Solomon. This was a thing that affected Israel down to when Isaiah was condemning the practice of eating forbidden food among, amongst the tombs. And I don't think it's a coincidence when Jesus cast out the demons from the garrison demoniac, which 
the one that said, we are legion, for we are many, who was living among the tombs. There was a herd of pigs right next door. There's a French scholar who argues that pigs were forbidden as unclean in many cultures in the ancient areas, and the only reason they were even raised was to offer up sacrifices to the dead. It's been hiding in plain sight in the Bible. It's just been translated out. For example, instead of the Rephaim rise up to greet Lucifer when he's cast out of heaven, the word Rephaim was translated as shades. And that's pretty, that happens a lot in the translations. So the Valley of the Shadow of Death, this practice has to do with the cult of ancestors in the ancient Near East. <clears throat> Amorite texts reveal the practice of monthly ritual meals for ancestors on the night of the new moon, the 30th day of the month. This monthly ritual, known as kispum, involves summoning ancestors by name and offering them food and drink. The kipsum ritual can be seen as a form of necromancy, as it involves summoning and interacting with the deceased ancestors uh, who are offered bread and drink in the ritual to provide sustenance in the afterlife. Failure to perform the ritual meant ancestors would fade into non-existence. Forgetting their names led to oblivion. The ritual practice persisted until at least the time of David and potentially beyond. Even David's household during the time of Saul with Saul possessed household gods suggesting the practice's prevalence. David's son Absalom erected a pillar, a remembrance marker in the Valley of the Kings to ensure his name endured because he didn't have an heir. Amorite kings in the region erected pillars to prevent fading into oblivion, encouraging offerings and remembrance. The practice aimed to appease and honor ancestral gods or ancestors, ensuring their continued existence and well-being. The reality was that people were being deceived by entities, potentially spirits of Nephilim destroyed in the flood. Similar practices continue in the present day in various cultures, such as, such as Madagascar, Haiti, and Mexico with the Day of the Dead, which exemplifies a continuation of rituals involving ancestors and offerings. The origin of these practices goes back to the Nephilim, tying back to Mount Hermon's history. The practice of persistence over thousands of years underscores its lasting cultural and spiritual significance. So there is a sky burial theory with the dolmens. <clears throat> Some scholars propose that dolmens were utilized for sky burials, where bodies were exposed to the elements and birds until only bones remained. Then the bones were buried in ossuary, which is a shaft tomb somewhere else. Uh, the Balls of Bashan. The, there's a, this is a paper that was written by this Dr. Robert D. Miller, and he was arguing that the phrase Balls of Bashan is not about famous cattle, because this is something that some people would say, oh, there must have been really famous cattle up there in Bashan. <clears throat> He's saying, no, the Bible's not referring to the Balls of Bashan as famous cattle, but about cultic practice. Although this has been suggested before, this essay uses archaeology and climatology to show ancient Golan was no place for raising cattle. He, he goes through in this paper and shows that, that the environment was not, the food environment and the water and everything else was, was, was not enough to sustain herds of cattle. The bulls of Bashan. has written, many bulls are surrounding me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Psalm 22 is a messianic prophecy written by David nearly a thousand years before Christ Jesus was born. Indeed, the ancient Hebrews, long before the time of Christ, recognized the messianic undertones of this passage. Yet, who are the bulls of Bashan that the Messiah would be encircled by? One recent researcher has pointed out, but the psalmist wasn't shown a vision of angry bulls from the Golan Heights surrounding Christ at the cross. He was given a glimpse into the future at spirits from Bashan, demonic entities represented by bulls who surrounded the cross to celebrate what they thought was their victory over Messiah. Uh, Robert Miller uh, recently used archaeological and climatological evidence, which we just referred to about, about there couldn't be cattle there. So uh, Satan and the rest of the rulers of the age gloried at the crucifixion of Christ. They did not understand that his death would bring about their downfall. So, so now we'll look at David pursuing into the valley. David, writing in the 23rd Psalm, was familiar with the area north of the Sea of Galilee because one of his wives was the daughter of the king of Geshur, which was based in Bethsaida, so he is familiar with this area. David chased a rebel all the way to a city called Avil Beth Mata, which is at the north end of this valley. 
David knew this was the beating heart of the Canaanite religion. There are Canaanite myths that place the activities of Baal in the Hula Marsh. This was an area that was known to be important to the Canaanite religion. David is saying that even though I'm in the middle of enemy territory, I'm no longer on the ground sacred to Yahweh. I'm on ground sacred to this enemy, enemy pantheon. I will feel it, fear no evil because my good shepherd is with me. It's like, hey, look, the shepherd is right behind me, and he's got a rod and a staff, and that rod is used for a cosmic beatdown. So if you've got a problem with me, power, principality, throne, dominion, whatever, talk to the shepherd because he's right behind me. So, so when he was going through this valley, he was probably seeing, meeting up with uh, tribal people at these dolmens <coughs> like this, and these tribal people are there on the 30th, and uh, they're preparing their food offerings. You know, so he probably saw all of this as he was going up through the valley. And so then he probably sat down and started thinking about it and thinking about it, writing some, writing some things. And uh, for instance, Psalm 22, he said, the, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, which he was saying that these entities that they were feeding were never satisfied because they keep at it doing it over and over and over and over. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. <clears throat> all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. The ancient world agreed. From the Testament of Reuben, dating in this, the dating of the 2nd century B.C., Charles was pseudepigrapha edition. <clears throat> For thus lewd women allured to watchers who were before the flood. As they continued looking at women, they lusted after them, and they conceived the act in their mind, for they changed themselves into the shape of men. That's an interesting one. And appeared to them when they were with their husbands, and the women lusting in their minds and their forms gave birth to giants, for the watchers appeared to them as reaching unto the heaven. Okay. Then we have the Testament of Naphtulu. We've got Sirach. We've got the Maccabees, the Damascus document, the Genesis Apocrypha, Hilo. Talks about this. Pseudophilo talks about this. First Enoch, Jubilee, second Enoch, third Baruch, Josephus takes this view, the Sibyls take this view, the Oracles, <coughs> second Baruch takes this view, the Targums take this view. There's a scholar by the name of Jap Dodens in the Netherlands who did a dissertation on this, just looking at the history of it. And I think he's uncovered everything that there is to uncover that we know of. And his, his conclusion is that 100% of the literature that speaks about this up until the time of the New Testament is done being written, that everything that's written up until that time, so the entire ancient past, all the way up to the first 200 years of the church, takes this view, 100%, that this was real, and they were dealing with reality. There's not a thing, single shred of any document saying that this was imaginary, that it wasn't real, that it was just psychological. There's nothing. That's a very powerful argument. You, can't look up, you can look up his dissertation on academia.edu. And this is, I'm getting this from Doug Van Dorn, but I did get the, I did get the paper. And, it's, and again, there's a link you can get it. It's no charge. So he also goes through the early church as well. There was a paper that was done on this by Newman. It was 30 years ago, and he did research on it, but then Dodens takes it to the next level and just uncovers about just everybody. The first 200 years of the church, we have 25 church fathers that all take the exact same view. And there's no disagreement for the first 200 years of the church so you know get when guys like Theodoret come along and Augustine, by that time, which is after 200 years and 300, 400, 500 years, by this time Enoch has really been lost to them. They don't understand what it actually said. And they start, and they, plus they lose, they lose where things are. They just lost a lot of information. They lost where cities were or that they even existed. They lost a bunch of history. Just, you know, human beings are good at losing stuff, getting all confused. So 
They, so they didn't understand what it actually said, and they start poo-pooing the idea and naysaying it and almost cursing it, like anybody who would take that view is a complete idiot. Well, they've just lost their history. <laughs> There's no other way to say it than they just don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what the church had always believed uniformly. This is such an incredibly powerful argument from history that if there's nobody else out there that we know of that took another view, then the burden of proof is not on anyone to prove that June Peter took this view. It really is astonishing when you read things like Justin Martyr writing, the angels transgressed this appointment, were captivated by love of women to beget children who are those that are called demons. This was written about the year 160 AD, less than 75 years if you take the, the late view of the writing of the book of Revelation, less than a century after the death of the last apostle. Consider, uh, let's consider an anti-translation. One scholar has recently done of Psalm 23. The idea comes from this French anthropologist, Clark Levi Strauss. This is not the guy who makes the pants, okay? He taught his students to use binaries or opposites in order to clarify roles and themes and text. Now, in doing this, you're going to be able to hear much more easily what lay behind the story that you're reading, which in this case is Psalm 23 <coughs> and why it was written the way it was. But as you hear it, it might be rather unnerving. But I believe it really helps you see the satanic backdrop behind Jesus' spiritual warfare. So here then is what is happening, not to David, but to his enemies who follow the gods of old. Okay, and by the way, the gods of old, the gods at that time were called shepherds. So now we're going to, revert, we're going to read what he came up with in reversing Psalm 23. The shepherd is my Lord, I shall be ever wanting. He forces me prostrate in barren wilderness. He misleads me to the stagnant waters. He depletes my soul. He instructs me in the ways of wickedness for his own schemes. Because I crawl through the valley of the shadow of death, I panic. For you menace me from a distance. Your sword and your spear, they terrify me. I prepare a table before you in the presence of your counsel. I give placation to you and offering. Surely, evil and heartlessness Pursue me every day, and I will wander in the tomb of the shepherd for eternity. So can you hear the evil? Does it not just ooze off the pages of the background that David would easily have been thinking of as he wrote the psalm from this place that he had gone through? So this is more of like, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your counsel, and the people are out there preparing these things before these, these guys, the spirits of the giants. And they're having to do this. And by the way, they had to do it a lot of times twice a month. So, and this is a reversal, right? Reversal of Psalm 23. So here's the people that, kind of people that David saw. And on the 15th and 30th, they would go out. On the 15th and the 30th, they were always, they, they had to go twice for the royalty, for the kings, the spirits of the kings and the, 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 the elite. They had to do it twice a month <coughs> for them on the 15th and the 30th. For their family members, they only had to do it once a month on the 30th. Okay, so they were out there twice a month. I mean, this, this had to take up a lot of time. So it was, it was a big, I guess it was good for the Hebrews because it was sucking up a lot of their economy and keeping them busy doing other things. <laughs> so, the Rephaim tribes worshiped their dead ancestors. These spirits, which were in fact the demonic spirits of the giants, had to be summoned once a month by name and then fed at a prepared dolmen table through a ritual to sustain them in the afterlife. <clears throat> Yeshua reversed this by saying, No, you eat of my flesh and drink my blood from my one-time sacrifice instead of you pouring out the blood of the grape and feeding the bread and sacrificing pigs to your deceased ancestors to sustain them month after month after month after month forever. You do this once from me and you will be sustained in the afterlife forever. It's a complete reversal of all that was taking place in and around the Sea of Galilee. So, Psalm 23, a Psalm of David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, the cup that they're, they're offering, you know, they're pouring a cup out for these guys, but my cup is now overflowing. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that is the last slide. Are we going to do anything else? Or are we? Do you want to do it after? We can do okay. Let's do. Let's uh, do. We want do a few questions. Yeah, we can do a few questions. Get a, if you got a microphone up back there. Oh, okay. All right. Well, oh, I see it. Okay, thanks. What? So, since the title is in the, these things are in the valley of shadow of the death, so in this psalm, it's very clear that even though I walk through this area where it's filled with dolmens and all this stuff that the giants and everybody was doing, I'm not going to fear any evil. And all of this area from Mount Hermon all the way down to the Dead Sea on the east side of the Jordan is where a lot of this stuff is taking place. Yep. And it's very interesting that Yeshua is baptized in the Jordan. And on his, his journey from the Galilee area, he went all the way to the Jordan River and came up that direction up to Jericho and then made his way up to the city. So it's interesting he took that route on the very far east of the land of Israel, close to this whole area um, that's happening here. So, yeah, just pointing out that m- m- nearly all of the stuff that Ward showed in the slides has to do with the things that were happening in this area from Hermon down to uh, the sea. And so this is called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. I think it's interesting that Yeshua spent a big part of his ministry up in enemy territory doing spiritual warfare. And basically everything he did, every miracle he did, and everything he did was defeating the different gods and showing his power over them, you know, that they were helpless against him. And I think it's interesting that David, seeing all these things, that were scary to a lot of people, really scary stuff. And then he's, he's saying, well, just, you know, I don't have to fear it. So the area that you were speaking of, is that in addition to Yahusha doing spiritual warfare um, and min- his ministry was largely in that area, when he spent 40 days in the desert, is that, would you say that was also the area that he was uh, doing spiritual warfare as well uh, when he was fasting after he was baptized? Yeah, where he was fasting was up in that area north of the Sea of Galilee. All that stuff was happening there. <clears throat> and when, when the temptation happened, and then when Satan took him to a high mountain, well, my, Mount Hermon is three times higher than anything else in that entire region. I mean, all of Israel, it's, it's the high mountain. There is no other high mountain. Took him up to, I mean, that was his, that was the center of his syndicate. <laughs> he, he. So, um, today, are, are the demons still 
in that area? Well, I mean, are they alive? Well, not by the Bible's definition of alive. They're dead, but they're, but they're not in Sheol or Hades. I mean, 90% of them were put in Hades, but they're still demons that are all over the place. So, you know? so their spirits are still these, in they're, that they're, area. They're the spirits of the Rephaim. I mean, the reason that these tribes, those tribes in that area around Israel, all these tribes were called the, the Rephaim tribes. They were called that because when they died, they became the Rephaim. You know, there's a lot of people say that the Bible in the Old Testament doesn't ever talk about demons. Well, yeah, it does talk about demons. It's the Rephaim. The scholars just didn't understand that until recently. So any words talking about the Rephaim, you know, those are the demons. Okay, because when these hybrid seed of Satan, you know, tribes, when they died, their souls, as I, you know, as we went over, they, they didn't have a place, no place had been prepared for them because they weren't supposed to ever exist. They only existed because of the rebellion of the watchers, right? So they're stuck on the surface of the earth until the day of judgment, except that a bunch of them got put in Hades at, you know, at the request of Noah. So... There's, there's a bunch of them that are in Hades, and there's a lot of verses about that, and, but there's also a bunch of them on the, on the earth. And, and, they're, and it tells us that they're the, there because Yahweh granted the request of Satan for them to be his minions. That's why, you have the, that's why Hollywood is putting out these movies about the minions. They're making these beings look cute and cuddly. And, and you know, it's like, oh, they're great. It's like, no. You know, it's propaganda. These minions are horrible, you know, they're horrible, terrible, you know, creatures that are just, and their purpose under Satan is to, you know, cause trouble for mankind. And why are they, why is Yahweh allowing that? Well, because mankind rebelled, you know. So now we have to, you know, if we reject him, well, then there's your choice, you know. If, you, if that's where you want to go, well, there it is, you know, go for it. I mean, you've got, you, you've got this choice, and we've always had this choice now because that's what we wanted, um, of either choosing to go with Yahweh or choosing to go with the other side that's got these guys that, you know, if you, believe, you want to live in the movies, they're great. They're fun, and they're funny, and, you know, that's, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have got that so buried in their head that that's what you're, they're actually thinking. You got So what is the practical application of what you shared with us for today for us? Well, I think the practical application is, is that we know, have a better understanding of what the scriptures are talking about. And we know what more about understanding of what David was talking about when he wrote Psalm 23. And Psalm 22, the chapter just before it, which we talked about in my previous presentation, uh, talking about the bulls of Bashan, okay? And David is saying, we don't need to fear them, okay? You know, we have the good shepherd who is there to protect us, you know? And as, and as, as several places have referred to, if you bring this understanding to people so that they can understand that this past history that's come out now it makes sense. The dots are connected. It makes logical sense of what they were doing. They weren't a bunch of crazy meth jobs, all right, back in the past. You can see what they were doing, and now it makes sense. And, you know, you, you, can now, you now have a clear choice. You can, you can see the choice that's laid out for you, you know, in which way. And look at the world today. <laughs> you really want to go into that? I mean, and you can understand now, looking at this, why is the world the way it is today? Okay, because people have, because so many people in that poll are not believing the Bible, they're letting, it's like uh, the book about the return of the gods and everything we've talked about. They're gaining power and they're coming back in and, and people are, you know, ending up being destroyed by these guys. Look at all the meth and all the drugs and all, you know, the, just the whole thing. It's, it's, you know, they, they need the message that, uh, you know, 
the stuff the world system put in your head is just a, is a bunch of propaganda. You need to understand what's going on. You know, it sort of seems like the, um, you know, the, the propaganda we're hearing about aliens coming from other planets and stuff, it's possibly just these, the 10% of these um, Raphael that are floating around yet are, uh, I mean, the greys and all that, they tell us, that, oh, we got to be careful. Here come the aliens from another planet. Yeah, I think the spiritual world is these entities are revealing themselves more and more, and they're being interpreted as, as ancient aliens, which, again, is just more propaganda. So. So I think with uh, all of this knowledge it, and everything's inversion, it, when you were talking about the uh, Raphaim and how they sit in the ta in their version of what the Most High's tabernacle would be offering um, to their gods, I think that what it does for me is it helps me to understand how much more powerful our offerings of prayer before the Most High uh, can be very effective, because right now there is a methodical uh, thing that's in place that all of us know. All of these things are, there's nothing new under the sun. It's still continuing to be uh, a methodical, very organized way that they're offering to the small G gods um, in the form of abortion, in the form of uh, pedophilia, all those type of things. And I think we need to mobilize as Yahweh's people and bring our offerings before the Most High in prayer and supplication, um, battling on the behalf of our children and our people. And that's how I like to, to kind of put some practical application to this. Yes, we see all these things that are happening in the world are just the repackaged, remarketed practices of the ancient world. It's just all happening all over again. You know, and then there's this idea of the yin and the yang, the equal opposing forces, okay, which also is false because the opposing forces are nothing compared to Yahweh, okay? They're, they're not equal opposing forces. They're little teeny tiny forces that, have, that you know, are nothing compared to the, the power of Yahweh. So does this have anything to do with current day Buddha? Because I know those that practice, they do bring food to these little statues they have of Buddha in their homes or wherever they have them. They bring them some type of food item and lay it before them every morning. Yeah, that's that same ancient practice. There's actually groups that go around the country and do this they pour out drink offerings for different things, for different people that have died in different ways. And they admit that they got this from the ancient practices. You know, it's becoming more and more prevalent, and pe the people need to be aware of what's going on so they can push back, push back against it. Okay, is that it? We want to wrap it up? So, uh, Dave, if you want to do the transition. We're going to say thank you to the, everybody online. Thanks for uh, being with us. And uh, yes, this is going to be on YouTube. And uh, you can go look that up on the Living Messiah channel on YouTube. And you can rewatch it and relook at the slides if you want to. I'm going to put a whole bunch of links in the video description below. There's a little, a little box that says video description. This is more. Click on more. It makes the box bigger. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to put a whole lot of clickable links to all these references and books and blogs and all this information so that you can click on it, look at it if you want to, all the papers, the whole thing. So you can go ahead and transition it. Okay, you're welcome. So uh, let's... Hmm? Yeah, let's, let's cl close in prayer real quick and then we're done. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We, we thank you for... Uh, your word and the fact that it's it's real and true and it shows your objective truth of the world that you that you hold it all in your hand and that uh, you are the one true true power and these other forces are nothing compared to you and that we can have 
faith in you, that you are the good shepherd and that you will lead us and protect us. And we thank you and hope and ask that you help us. When we go forward, we talk to other people. We can show them these things so that they can come out of the world system and, and be with you. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen.